Time to get started. Let's all stand, and we're going to sing, Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous reigns. Gloria in excelsis. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. Y'all get a nap? Y'all need to wake up. Y'all didn't. Y'all even singing just then. Everybody sounded quiet. I know it's a Christmas song, but we can still sing it on the t on the twenty seventh. Hey, let me just run a, a little poll right here on the words Gloria. How many of y'all can carry that out one breath? Okay. How many of y'all like me? You pause and catch back up and, and finish it. The rest of us catch back up and rest. Of, all right. I'm just just curious. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Well, obviously you didn't get enough, so you had to come out and get a little bit more Jesus tonight. So we're glad, we're uh, thankful for you to be here tonight. Uh, would you please bow your heads and hearts with me as we go, to the Lord, in prayer together? Father God, thank you for your presence here this morning, God, and we invite you back here tonight. God, our confession is that without you, Lord God, we would just go through the motions, Father God, but we would leave unchanged. And God, we don't want that, Lord God, so we invite you once again, God, just to visit this place, dear Father God, and just uh, saturate this place with your presence, dear Father God. Change us, dear God. Lord, you know, dear Father God, uh, uh, just the, the needs of our heart, Father God. So God, I just praise you just for just blessing uh, Brother Keith and, and just use him tonight as your mouth peace, dear God. May we hear from heaven tonight, and God, I'll thank you for how you'll bless. I know you can. I know you want to, and I pray believing you will, Father, and we just ask all this in the name of Jesus. We pray believing, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. I reminded you this morning, I want to remind you again tonight about our upcoming revival, and it's going to be January the 10th uh, with Michael Combs. It'll be a, a, a full concert on, on, on that Sunday evening, two weeks from tonight, then beginning on the 11th, which is Monday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, the 11th, 12th, and 13th, Rick Corn will be here for his 25th year here at Black Rock. And so we're just excited, anticipated. I remember going into last year, you know, just as my first time as a pastor being here, you know, to, to, to host Rick Corman Combs and just excited about it. You know, the, the same excitement, anticipation is here again because I remember what God did last year. We're just, we're just believing God for greater things than he did last year. And I don't know what that means. I'll leave that up to God. You know, if we're going to do our part. I encourage you to help us. You know, there's flyers in the back back there. We, we've already po started began posting them in various places around town. So grab some flyers, invite some people, and go on social media and um, and, and just you know, invite some people. Just you know, get them here, and especially 
people that you know that need to hear the gospel, that need Jesus. So we encourage you to, to help us out, to, to, uh, to invite people, spread the word you know, about revival. You know, uh, I'm not getting into a, a message on revival because what do I know about revival, right? But I do know this, we can't, we can't bring it, only God can send it when the conditions of our heart are right. You know, so between now and then, I don't want to encourage you, you know, just to, uh, just to up, your, uh, up your ante. And what I mean by that is, you know, spend more time with God in prayer and devotion, praying for revival, praying for lost people, praying, you know, just for, uh, for God to send a spiritual awakening to our church and community. And so I appreciate you praying for that. We, will still, uh, we are still receiving the Lottie Moon offerings. If you still have not, a ch- have, um, have not had a chance to give, uh, just, a, a, just a brief reminder, every dime and dollar you give supports international missionaries all around the world, countries are, that we will probably never go to, you know, uh, but there are missionaries. There are 4,000 IMB missionaries right now you know, uh, around the world. They don't have the comforts of being at home and receiving family at Christmas time like we do. Most of them aren't even here in the States at Christmas time. They're still on the mission field, but you know, they, don't, they don't want us to be sorry for them. They, don't want us to, they want us to continue to support them, though. And we can do that through prayer, but also a very tangible way is by giving through Lottie Moon offering to continue to support the mission work going around the world. I mentioned this this morning. I do want to spend a little time on this tonight, and that is next Sunday uh, um, at 4.30 in the afternoon. We're going to meet here uh, uh, for some training. David Drake, our director of missions, is going to train our leaders and even our lay people. Uh, sir, ma'am, if, if you're interested in helping out with altar indecision, uh, uh, counseling, when people come forward, uh, we encourage you to be here next Sunday at 4.30 for that. And if you just sit through it and decide, well, this is not for me, at least you'll know you've sat through it. You know it's not for you. So don't not come and not wonder. I wonder what that was about. Come and find out, all right? Last but not least, if you are a, a guest here tonight, we're so grateful to have you here with us this evening. So grateful that you chose to be here. A number of churches in, uh, in Nassau County you could have chosen to go to, but we're grateful you chose to, be, to come here. And so if you are a first-time guest, we're about to have a moment of fellowship where people can greet you and greet one another. But before we do that, if you're a first-time guest, would you please do us the honor of just raising your hand so we can know who our first-time guests are? We got one over here. Thank you for choosing to be here. One right here, right, right down front here, Brother John. Brother Ronnie, you got one right here. You got, I got one right down front here. If you would take that Connect card and fill out both sides of it, and at the end of our service, please take it to our foyer. There's a huge welcome banner there. We'd like to bless you with a gift from our church, so please carry it back there at the end of our service. Would you please, at this time, take an opportunity to stand and greet your neighbor tonight.
we return to our seats, let's sing it. It came upon the midnight clear. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men from heaven's all gracious King. The The world has suffered long Beneath the angel's strain Have grown two thousand years of wrong And man at war with man Hears not the love song which they bring Oh, hush the noisy men of strife And hear the angels sing By prophet bards foretold, when with the ever circling years comes round the age of gold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors flee, and the whole world give back the song which now. be seated. We're going to sing Away in the Manger. This is probably going to be the last time that we sing these, these good old Christmas hymns for this season. How many of you was a part of uh, the Christmas caroling this year? I'll tell you what, if you, if you didn't participate in that this year, I want to encourage you next year to think about doing that because we had, it was a, a real blessing to go around to our, to our uh, uh, the older folks and, and the same. Yep. Okay, away in a manger. Lord, we thank you for this, another opportunity to come into your house and to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for this uh, special time of the year that we uh, are in remembrance of our Lord and Savior who was born to us. Um, Lord, that uh, the word became flesh and we, his name is in scripture called Emmanuel meaning God with us. Lord, might 
we not only be mindful of his birth, which was necessary for him to come into this world as a man uh, and 100% uh, divine, but uh, he came for the purpose of dying for us on the cross and shedding his blood for the remission of our sins. And Father, we're, may we always be mindful and thankful for that, Lord. Lord, I ask now that uh, you would give us uh, open minds, open ears, and receptive hearts to the message that you've put on Keith's heart to uh, share with us this evening. I pray, Father, that we not only be hearers of your word, but that we may be doers also. Now, as we come to this portion of this worship service, we ask that these tithes and offerings would be used in accordance with your divine will. We ask them in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, Brother Keith, you know, this is his home church. Then that um, some of our people are, know him very well. They should change his diapers in the nursery. You know, I'm grateful to know that uh, I'm glad that uh, at least his sermons don't stink nowhere near as bad as he used to. Amen. You know, with all, with all joking aside, I want to speak right now before he starts preaching and, and, and just brings a message tonight to every, uh, to every children's worker that works in Vacation Bible School in Wana. Or the ins and outs every Sunday morning teaching our children, you never know the outcome of that child's life. So look at every child important. You never know, you know, who, what, uh, what great giant of the faith you may be uh, speaking into and help raise up. So look at every child through the lenses of what God can and will do in their life. It's funny that he would say that tonight because the message, I think, what you will find is a lot of the same thing that you never know the power of one word that you will have in someone else's life. All of you have had many words in my life, some more than others. Um, some of you like to talk like I do a lot. And uh, so a lot of what you've said has had an impact. But more than that, the way you've lived your life has, has directly um, shown me the way that I'm to live my life. And so many of you here tonight 
whether you know it or not, I have fond memories of, whether it be Uncle Farrell and drinking you who's on his front porch or, or the many other memories that I have with each of you, you, you have all touched my life in, in many ways. So tonight as we talk about this, I want, I want to encourage you to remember that you never know the power of a word. So if you would please stand with me tonight as we open up the scriptures and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. And it says in my version in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Please bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, tonight I ask that you would do something I cannot do, that you would speak your word tonight, that you would flow in this place, and that you, Father, would make your name known, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to speak to every single one of us tonight. God, please hide me behind your cross and and prepare me for the work that you want to do, God. Tonight, would you not let anyone hear my stuttering and my stammering, God, but let them hear you, let them hear the words you would have for them, Father. I thank you, and it's because of your name that we will stand and glorify you at the end of this service and each day until our lives are over. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, amen. Tonight, um, good news is there's only two points. There's not three, and so maybe we get out of here sooner, maybe we don't, I don't know. But um, this is a message that was, while this morning's message was very easy to write and very, very simple and spoke to some, I think this is a message that that speaks to all of us tonight. And that's why I saved it for the core church, for the people who would return and who already have that basis of biblical knowledge and maturity. Because tonight I want to I talk to you about something that God has been burdening me about uh, for some months now. A burden that causes me to, to lose sleep. A burden that causes me to just, I don't know how you handle your problems, but sometimes I just go take a nap. I mean, just I take a nap and I wake up. That way I can handle this burden. A burden that God has so graciously bestowed upon me, and that I, I beg Him to continue um, to keep it there. And, and a burden, if I'm being honest, that as I come back home and as I, I, I just have been reading in other chapters of the Bible and reading in, in other content, has begun to, again, not be as strong as it was. And so tonight I want to come to you and talk to you about this subject, and that is raising the bar. Um, I come to you tonight burdened by the complacency that I see in my life and much of what makes up the church in America. I come tonight praying that God would show you what I can't, and that is the need that he has for you. I come tonight begging you to learn what God is teaching me the hard way. As many of you know that I went last year on a trip to Ethiopia, and God just began to open doors. I mean, just, you've heard some of you, my testimony from Ethiopia, how I came and I talked about the Gorsha and things that God had taught me. But what you don't know is what led me to that decision to go on that trip. The other night, someone shared a, a post um, of the convocation where this man was speaking that led me to make the decision to go to Ethiopia. And I just, last night, I mean, I told you this morning, I'm not very emotional. You know, I cry when the national anthem plays at the NASCAR race and, you know, the people go over when I drop my sandwich, but I'm not very emotional. And last night, I, I was holding back tears as I heard the words of this man, and I, and I will tell you those words later tonight. And so this man was a man who grew up um, away from God, and one night in a factory heard God say to him, to find Jesus. And so he, he went, and he went to the, the old-fashioned Southern Baptist Church down the road in Kentucky, United States, and he met Jesus. And what he, what he began to realize was the radical call that Jesus had placed on his life. And so he felt called to go to the uttermost. He felt called to go to be a missionary in a foreign land like we talked about just a minute ago with the IMB. He went to a place called, I'm, I'm going to mess up the name, but uh, 
Magadishu. I only read it, so I can't really pronounce it good. But it's a place that many of you will be familiar with. It, it's Somalia. It's where, you know, the movie Black Hawk Down and where our military went in, and, and that movie was based after that. It's a place of extreme violence, a place of extreme evil. And this man went and for 10 years served. And he came and he, and he, his, he began with saying, I come to you today angry at myself and angry at God. And, and he be, just began to share his heart. He just began to talk about all the things that he'd seen and all the things that he had, had, had done and how he wished he would have done more and how he wished that he would have said more. And so I want to share with you a story that he shared with us that day. It was of a man who was so willing to go out of his way for a friend that it just drove him to tears. He, he had to bury a son, this man, um, and, I, and I encourage you to read his book. I've been reading the book. I just got done reading the book, and God has just been, I mean, more than Ethiopia, he's just been, it's one of those things where God is tearing a hole inside of your heart in a precise, just potent words that this man is writing. It's like a 300-page book, and I mean, I'm proud of myself. I don't never read, and here I am reading this book, and God is just ripping me in the chest. And so what he began to talk about, he told a story. He, he was in Kenya, and his son passed away. His son died of, of uh, he was very young. I mean, he was a teenager, and he had, they had to bury a child in Kenya. Um, I can't imagine what they, how that was. I mean, you know, not being in, in the U.S. where they lived for so many years and not being with family. But they had to bury a son in Kenya. And so he picked up the short rave wave radio and he, he already talked about how his church was was a church like many of you were I mean they were at his house every night cooking dinner they even went to the point of singing them to sleep they would sing to them in their living room until they fell asleep but this one man this one Muslim man um, he, he was a very extroverted he was much like myself he moved his arms around he talked a lot and and so he he picks up the radio and he tells him that his his son has passed away and nothing no, no response, no nothing. And so he just thought there was a bad connection. And so five days later, and they're in Kenya now. They're not in Somali, Dad. They're not in Mogadishu. They are five days away in Kenya. This man, as soon as he heard those words, he put down the radio and he began to walk. And he walked and he, and he said that he climbed through um, areas while clans, clans were fighting each other. He climbed around wars going on. He, he rode camels. He walked around minefields. He walked through minefields. Five days to come and to just help this man bury his son. And he went to the point of even at the funeral, sitting between the man and the woman. And at the end, he grabbed his hands and, and he said, we're, we buried our son. And he began to weep with them. And the, the most amazing thing and the, the most that I hope you get tonight was what he said at the end. He served 10 years with his people, and he looked for multiple time, multiple ways and multiple times to share the gospel. But of 150 Christians in the whole Somalidad area, there was four left, and four of them got killed. They were his really good friends, and they, they got killed one, one day, and, and they never got to bury the bodies of, of many of those Christians. They never got to see the bodies, and so, so he had no... No more Christians who he who he knew of. He's in this time of depression. His son has died, and he, he, he and he can't even understand when he speaks to us that his ministry of ten years had no conversions and that nothing nothing happened. And, and he began to wrestle with what it looked like to preach to a, to a people that have been so persecuted and a place where it's so hard to share the gospel. And so this man who walked five days, um, when when this man visited back to his homeland with this man who had to bury his son for the last time. He stood and he told his story, as was the custom of, of his great journey that they had sent him on of five days and how he had rode in trucks with, with goats and, and ridden camels and walked through minefields. And at the end, he told of the funeral and how there was a hope and a joy and a peace that Muslims, him, him quoting himself, that we could not know. Why can't we know where our family members are? Why can't we know that we're already in paradise? And he looks with, with 10 other staff members who are all Muslim, who work for this amazing, huge relief company that, that just is, is supplying food and water to starving people, especially in that time, in the time of war. And he looked at him and he said, why have you kept Jesus from us? Why have you kept Jesus from us? And the man didn't know what to say because for 10 years he worked in the name of Jesus and he taught in the name of Jesus, but he did not know how he could physically 
talk about in persecution the name of Jesus. So he wrote this book about his journeys where he traveled and he, he met with believers who lived under great persecution. And what he found is what I think we would find that led us here to America, that led us to, to where we're at tonight. And that is in great places of persecution, the gospel flourishes. And so, so what we found is the same gospel, that this radical gospel that led us here, what I'm finding is I am suffering from a disease that many of us in countries with such freedom suffer from. That is freedom. The same freedom that we're so blessed to have, that we're so, so blessed to gather and worship like we are tonight, is the same freedom that is eating at me and, and making these, these places of complacency. And, and, and while we stand here tonight, people are being persecuted for their faith. Brothers and sisters, and, and I mean, I read stories that, that just shook me to the core, literally to the point of shaking, of stories who, of pastors who spent 17 years in, in prison, of, of just church members who, who were found in a home church and they spent years in prison with, with no food and no water and just horrible conditions and where God would just miraculously show up and they had the strength to continue on. And what I found in myself was I didn't like what I saw. Because if I'm being honest... God began to show me just how off the mark I live here in America with my ministry. And so tonight, what I want you to get is not only the need for you, but the reality that I've come to realize is that an attitude that was brought out by persecution has been forgotten in freedom. An attitude that, I, that we all lived that, and our, our ancestors lived and were persecuted for in, in great times of freedom, many times we forget. I suffer from a disease that many people in our country and others like ours suffer from, and that is freedom. The truth is, the truth that I want you to grasp tonight is this. You are called to be a missionary. So before you freak out on me and think you have to sell all that you own and go to Somali Dad or another place, I want to explain what that word missionary means because we've hijacked the term in America. We, you know, we, we take it and we made it something it's not. And in that, I think we've created this, this gap of understanding in many of our church members. Many, many, you know, many statistics say that 20% of the church does all the work. And, you know, the other 80% don't do much. And, and I know from, from a church like mine and a church like I know many of you here tonight, that's not the case. It's more like 50 and 60% are in, in full-time ministry and doing so much. But the reality is there's this gap in understanding about our mission. The word missionary literally means a person sent on a religious mission to promote Christianity in a foreign country. As I was reading this, I was reminded of Hebrews 13, 14, in which, and this is the Keith version, <laughs> says this, we have no lasting city, we hope for one that is to come. Multiple times we see that this is not our home, and this is not the place that we get to spend eternity. This is not the place that we reside. And while this is a very, very, very long mission trip, some 80 or 90 or some 100 years, it's still just that. We are not called to make ourselves at home here because this is not our home. And God began to dig that into my soul. And he began to burden me for lost people like never before. And that's, that's amazing. With the calling that I feel God has called me, I mean, I love the fact that he's burdened me for lost people because I want to be an evangelist and reach lost people. But man, was it a burden that is just driving me crazy. And it's a burden I don't want to go away. But the reality is many of us have forgotten that we're called to live on a mission. So tonight I hope that as we look at these, this passage that we'll understand the mission that God has called us on because what I want you to understand tonight, what has made this message so hard to write and so hard to even begin is this, that God needs you. We need you. I need you. Brother John needs you because you're not anything less than we are. You are called to live on mission. Tonight I'm going to say a lot of things that we know, a lot of things that we we, we would say that we know, but in the back of our minds, if we're being honest, this is going to be one of those where Jesus speaks to the multitudes and, and we leave saying, man, this is hard to hear. This is hard to grasp. I mean, I cannot even grasp what it looks like to live on mission. When I read stories of the New Testament and stories of persecuted Christians, and I look at my life, and I'm, if I'm being honest, I understood this truth. That a lot of times, if I was to look and examine my life, I didn't live like I was on mission. I lived like I'm on vacation. 
I go, to, I go to Ethiopia and I live two weeks like I'm on mission. I mean, we wake up and we pray and we spend time with God and we go and we serve. And every single day and every single second of the day is how can I reach these people around me, whether it be hanging out with friends and, and worshiping together or whether it be sleeping and napping and resting. Whatever it was, I lived as if I was on mission and I come back to America. And if I'm being honest, I'm living like I'm on vacation. I mean, just think of the missionaries that you know. We, we know missionaries that came out of Blackrock. They were friends with my mom and dad and our dear friends of us. We know missionaries. And if, if the missionaries that we know of today live like us, I don't think they would continue getting their IMB support. And what I found the craziest when I went to Ethiopia is the first thing missionaries do is they get a job. They get a job as a platform to meet people. And, and my understanding was we, we helped them live. And, and what I found out was that was to help them do ministry. But they had a job where even if it paid, you know, cents to our dollar, it was a job to make a platform. And so the very thing we would think they wouldn't do, they began to do. And they began to put themselves in a place like you are today as an electrician, a plumber, at a mill, at a, as an engineer, so that they could share the gospel. And I began to examine my life and, and realize that the amount of time I spent doing stuff that didn't matter for the kingdom made me look like I was on vacation a lot more than I look like I'm living on mission. So tonight I want to look at just two truths. The first truth, before we look at the truths, is, is, is I think we've lowered the standard. What God has shown me is I think I've lowered my standard. I, I've lowered what it looks like to live abandoned for Christ. And so tonight I want to look at only two things, and that's the orders we've been given and the order in which they've been given. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight, we're going to speed things up and begin, is the orders. I mean, everyone here knows what it is to have orders. Many of, many of you, some of you may have served in the military. Many of you know my testimony. Before I became where I am today, God drug me through a heart problem to get it out of my brain that I was going to the Marines. I mean, I was dead set on the Marines. I was doing everything to go towards the Marines. I was doing everything I could. And God drug me to this place today because as we talked about today, he has a plan and he's so sovereign. And so today I stand before you. And so, so many of us, we don't understand those military orders. But what we do understand is fast food orders. I understand me some fast food orders. I've been to places like McDonald's where they get it wrong sometimes. Uh, my, my mother sent me a picture while I was at college the other day of a bun and pickles and lettuce and tomato. And there's one thing missing. The burger. She said she ate it, though, because she was hungry and she didn't feel like going back in the line. I was like, well, that's your own fault. Don't you blame McDonald's. You wouldn't go back. I've been to Sonic when it first opened, and the same thing happened to me. I get this cool little sandwich and no burger. But I've also been to places like Huddle House. They don't get it wrong, okay? We went the other night. I had, I had a wedding to do yesterday. I got the privilege to do a wedding, and man, is that much more nerve-wracking than this tonight. And we went to Huddle House the night before, and at 1 in the morning, my buddy texts me and says, you know, I'm vomiting. Just want you to know that. I'm very mad at you. My thing is, man, I treat it like a missions trip. I go in knowing that it's good, and I don't want to know what's in it. And, and I go with that, that mindset of God, where you lead me, I'll follow, and what you feed me, I'll swallow. I mean, I'm going to go in, I'm going to eat, and they don't get it wrong. So the other night, they got it wrong. Before I even had the knowledge they got it wrong, they threw away that country fried steak, and they gave me another one without gravy on it. And man, I was, I was pumped. I was like, yes, this, they don't get it wrong. But we've all been there when they get it wrong. So tonight, I want us to look at what it looks like to get it right. So the orders we've been given, the first thing in verse 8, and that's where we're going to spend all our time tonight, is this. It says, but you will, will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The truth tonight is the first order is to wait on the Spirit. The first order of business, the first order we've been given is to wait on the Spirit. Notice those, that phrase, you will. Jesus didn't say, you know, go. And the Holy Spirit, he'll be there in a minute. Like, you know, he didn't say, go and... The Holy Spirit, he'll catch up when he, when he gets to you. He said, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and when that happens, you will be my witnesses. Because the disciples understood a key truth that we need to understand tonight. They knew that they had no ability to do the work of God, therefore they waited on the Spirit of God. And that's a truth that tonight we can rest on. I mean, I can rest knowing that no matter how many bad jokes and messed up words and made up words I said tonight, that you're not hearing me, you're hearing 
the Spirit of God. And so the Spirit, we know, convicts, He guides, He regenerates, He glorifies, He reveals, He leads, He sanctifies, He empowers, He fills, He teaches, He bears witness, He anoints, and many, many other things. But tonight what I want to talk about you on is not the doctrine of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, but what it is that, that has practical and tangible application for us today. The Holy Spirit is ordaining moments for you to come in contact with lost people every single day. The Holy Spirit is ordaining moments for you to come in contact with people, lost and saved people, every single day. Because you are a missionary. You've been called to a culture and a context. And He is ordaining moments for you to live on mission. Yes, you, not a minister, a missionary. The Spirit does all the work. We get the blessing. I mean, isn't that the amazing thing? Like, I, I remember father-son or grandfather-son projects. Like, my grandpa did all the work. My dad did all the work. I got to hold a flashlight. But at the end, I got to go out to eat or whatever we did. You know, I got to get the privilege of knowing that I helped fix something. Or in or our cases, we broke about ten things before we fixed the, the real problem. And so I got the privilege of knowing and being a part of that. But they did all the work. The Holy Spirit today is ordaining moments for you to come in contact with people, so all you have to do is speak, and He does the work. Right now, as I'm talking, you're not hearing this redneck southern kid from Yulee, Florida. You're hearing the Word of God, not because I'm anything special, but because the Holy Spirit does the talking. If you hear me, you left getting cheated tonight, I promise. If you, if you leave here saying, Keith, you, you know, I heard you tonight, then I'm sorry that you didn't hear the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God does all the work. And we can rest in the, the fact that whether we give a five-point sermon or we just tell someone the love of, that God has for them or our testimony, or even if you do what many of you did in my life and you just lived it out, the Word and the Spirit of God does the rest. And then I want to look at one thing before we go on is what I realized was in great places of suffering, we see great salvation work. I realize that, you know, as we look at the New Testament and the book of Acts, sometimes if we're not careful, we can get this mentality that, man, I wish that would happen while I was alive. I wish that would happen. I mean, I wish I could see dead people raised and wish people, you know, come to Christ because the word of God and God's spirit spoke to them. I wish I could see, you know, people healed. I wish I could see amazing things happen. And, I, and what I want to come to help you realize today is many times in places like today where we have the word of God, which is better than anything else we can have, and that we have the spirit of God and we have the knowledge of who God is and we have churches on every single corner, praise God, there is not a need for the God of heaven to do something that we can do already. I mean, the Spirit is already, I said, ordaining moments for us to speak to people. So why on earth would the God of the universe speak to someone when he has tons and tons and tons of missionaries already? And sometimes in our culture, we don't get to see the amazing things that God is doing all over the planet. And so I read in this book of, of just co this collection of what he found in persecution where God was just showing up and showing out. I mean, in places where there was not a single Christian, the author writing this book, and while he's while he's getting his, his research and material, he tries to meet with his pastor multiple times, and it just doesn't work out. He continues to get sick and messed up, and he has a, a, you know, he's on this journey. He's across the country. He just can't come back. And so this guy keeps emailing him and emailing him and emailing him saying, please, we want you to come here. I want, I want you to meet these people. And he's like, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Well, after enough pastors had canceled, he finally made time. And when he got off the plane, he, he would, you know, this pastor or this doctor that continued to pester him, he was a lot like I would have been. He gets off the plane, and as he steps down the runway, and he sees these four men dressed in all Muslim attire. and Because you can tell when someone is Orthodox Muslim. The doctor says, I'll see you later. And he takes off. And so these, these Muslim men, they walk up to this guy, this, this white American guy, and they said, hey, we're Christians. And he was just dumbfounded. So he, he does what any, you know, someone who's just surprised dude, he hops in the car with them. And so he goes, and he finds out later that the Spirit of God led them through, because in their culture, dreams are a big deal. They pay attention to dreams. And so God, knowing their culture, gave them a dream, and in the dream they all four of them, it said, find Jesus. And so he led them multiple, you know, multiple miles. One was like 29 miles. They all meet each other by the, by the sovereignty of God, and they begin to pray that someone would come and teach them about God because they, I mean, they have no scriptures. They have nothing. All they have is this dream. They've been met together. They pray together, and they, they have a couple little manuscripts of different New Testament articles, and 
all of a sudden, this big old white guy, knowing nothing about this, comes down, and God led him to them so that they could know more about God. And that's the, that's the Holy Spirit that we wait on because we have no power. We have no ability to do anything. And so we are called, the first order of business is to be led and wait on the Spirit. Let us never wander away from where the Spirit is leading because we have no power. We must always remember we have no power apart from the Spirit. And so the second thing is not only as, as, we're, as we're cruising through, not only are we called to wait on the Spirit and be led of the Spirit, but the second thing, and this is where it gets hard, we're called to be as witnesses. And so I looked, I looked at the word in Greek there and what it meant to be his witnesses. And that word witness literally means this. It means a record, a testimony, and, and we would know that because the witness is something that's in the jury. And then the last word is this, a martyr. You see, the very same word there in the Bible, I mean, I'm talking the original translation, is the same word used in Revelation and multiple other places for the word martyr. See, the reality is, everyone in here, we may never go and die for the gospel, but we're martyrs. Our old self has been, has been demolished. Our old self has, has died, and we have been called to a new life in Christ. We've signed a blank check saying, God, I give you my life. And the reality is, what I found in my life, I believe that our biggest threat to our mission of God is our dead bodies we continue to trip over. I continue to trip over this, this hick, country, Keith, every day when I get up. I continue to struggle with my flesh, and that's my biggest threat. My biggest threat is the Keith that has already died and given his life to Christ. Every day as I say, God, I want to give you my all, the dead Keith kind of gets in the way. He says, well, you know, that, that seems a little bit crazy. I'm sure they'll be fine. I'm sure he'll, he or she will be fine. I'm sure I don't need to talk to them. God, I'm sure we just happen to run into each other. I'm sure that someone else will do that. My biggest threat, I'm personally, this, this isn't no one else, my biggest threat is my dead body that I continue to trip over. The church's original design was this, to be a body of witnesses who tell the evidence of God in their life. And we, we all know that, but, but sometimes if we're not careful in our culture of these awesome, amazing buildings we're in, we will... The statistics say, John Maxwell says, that the first thing to go in a church is evangelism. The first thing to go. The people stop telling people about Jesus, and they just invite them to church. Because we have a building, you know, the pastor, the minister, he'll, he'll present the gospel. But did you know that the, the pastor's job is to equip you, to equip the saints? So, so I'm called, and Brother John's called, to equip you to do the work. We should, if we were looking at a map today, the arrows shouldn't be pointing towards the church. They should be pointing out of the church. We go, we be the church. In, in the reality that we are the church, people become a part of the church, and we bring them to our local church of other people who are the church. If this building was to burn down tomorrow, we would still be the church. And God has called us to be the church. And I can't wait till we get to the second part. And, and, and the minister, by the way, is not more holy than you are. The minister is no more holy than the missionary. Sometimes if we're not careful, our culture, especially when we're lost, you know, for any of us who spent any time being lost, because we were at lost, but some of us spent in Christian culture, we knew the pastor, we knew those people. But I have friends that, man, the thought of them stepping in this building and it not falling is just, it doesn't make sense to them. I have friends who won't get near a church because they think me standing up here, they're going to just fall down dead because the fear of God. But the reality is, while my, 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 purpose and my platform my platform is different our purposes remain the same and that is to build up the kingdom of God and so every single one of us may not be ministers of the church tonight but we're missionaries of God and that is where God has got you is far better than any other platform you could ever be and so tonight as we see we see our orders I want I want to get to the good part and that's the order in which they are man when I saw this I was talking to a guy in my dorm room, and he just hit me with this truth bomb, and I was like, that'll preach. I mean, I don't know if I can do it, but that'll preach. And so we've seen the orders we've been given, but notice the order in which they're in. We all have a morning routine. We all have something we do, right? We all have, uh, you know, guys will do the, the pat, pat, pat. Like, you got wallet, keys, cell phone, and nowadays, like, you... You, you get out your car, and it's like they're playing patty cake or something. I mean, they, always, they got this routine. And, man, if you mess up your routine, you're done. I mean, I've slept through classes before because I didn't have enough time to do my whole routine, and I did not want to go to class feeling undone. And so I, would, I slept through a class. I mean, God forgive me, I had enough absences to do so. But I was thinking, I don't have time to have devotion and prayer this morning, so I'm just going to sleep and then get up 
and have my devotion to prayer. Then I'll start my day. And, and we have routines, you know, whether it be put the toothbrush on the right side of the sink and the deodorant on the left side of the sink or whatever. We all have routines. And if you get them things out of order, oh, man. I mean, I couldn't imagine if my mom was to move my dad's wallet other than he'd be stranded in Jacksonville on the side of the road when the truck ran out of gas. Because if it's not in sight, I'm learning it's gone. I mean, I'm just not going to see it. And so we all have order in our life. So I want to look at this verse and notice the order in which it is. The first thing we see in verse 8, we see that, you know, we're going to wait on the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to, we're going to wait on the Spirit. He's going to do the work, and then we're going to be His witnesses. And then notice what it says. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So to Americans today, we kind of don't get that because, you know, we're not looking at it from Jerusalem right now. Like We're looking at it from Jacksonville or Yulee, right? Like we don't get it. But let me, let me lay out some groundwork for, for what's going on. Jerusalem is their home. Jerusalem is, it is literally one of the most important cities in the world home to three major religions, and it's the place where Jesus was killed, we know that, and rose, but more than that, it is their home. I mean, you see it in their thoughts already. Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I mean, that's all Jews are worried about. Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he's like, hey, 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 chill out. You know, I got work you don't even know about yet. And then he tells them, and so this is their home. Jerusalem is their home, and so notice the order here. The first thing Jesus says on this mission to be his witnesses is the first thing you need to get in order is your home. The very first thing you need to begin in your home. And there's a beautiful truth in that. The first place we need to begin to witness is at our home. Whether that be with your family or if you have no family. Your personal relationship with God is the very first thing and the the only thing that can be at, at the foremost. Because if you have nothing, you can give nothing. I, I wrote a quote because I write these mean quotes to myself when I, when I oversleep and stuff to try to make my, myself get up. Because Sleepy Keith is, man, I just don't like that guy. He just, man, if, if I'm tired, I am not a cool guy. I just, I can't get up and I'm mad at myself later. So I write these mean notes. And one of the less mean ones was this. You cannot lead others if you can't lead yourself. And that's such a truth. If you can't lead yourself tonight, if you can't lead yourself, Keith Flanagan, then you just can't lead others. You can't lead those youth. You can't lead those God on the hall. You have to lead yourself. And the truth is today, before we can go to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, we have to lead ourselves. We have to lead our families. We have to lead our homes. And so we see first the order is Jerusalem. But then notice where it gets, it's really cool here. Judea and Samaria. So I looked on a map and, and where this stuff was at. Judea was kind of like their neighborhood. You, you have Jerusalem, the city, and then you have this, this, this bigger part is Judea. But then he throws Samaria, Samaria in there because we all know Jews did not get along with Samaritans. So he's just throwing them a bone right here. Like, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. Not only your neighborhood, but the ones you don't like. And how, I mean, I mean man, Jesus has a sense of humor. And if you don't think so, you haven't met the real Jesus. I mean, he's, he's sarcastic sometimes. And here I think he just said it with a smile. You're going to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And so notice this, this, what's special about Judea. No matter where God has called you, your neighborhood is your mission. Tonight we're all missionaries. And I hope you understand that. I hope you get that, what we talked about. We've hijacked the word and meant for you know, other than America. But you're missionaries tonight. And your neighborhood where you have, your neighborhood you have right now, Yulee, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, Fernandina Beach, Florida, that is your mission field. No matter where you, where you say, God, will you show me my mission field? Hey, where's your house? Because wherever your home is and wherever your neighborhood is, wherever your career is, wherever your, your playtime and your hobbies are, that is your mission field. And, man, God began to dig this into me, and it just burdened me because I have a lot of hobby places. I have a lot of places where I come in contact with a lot of people, and if I look at my life, it, it looks more like a vacation spot in a mission field. And so your career is not a means of making money for the ministry. It is your ministry. When I went to Ethiopia, I traveled thousands of miles to realize that simple truth when I met a guy named Kaba, or Kabada, or Kabe is what I called him. I met him and he was, the, I mean, I love him to death. If I could get one person from Africa and just drag him with me to my wedding or something, it'd be Kabe. I mean, I love Kabe to death. And, and he was just, man, me and him fell in love. And one of the first things I heard about him was that he took soccer, and he, he, you know, he loved soccer, he played soccer, and he had 82, and I told you this before, 82 young people who he played soccer with, and he used it as a platform for the gospel. You see, he understood what these missionaries understood, what other people understood, and what sometimes we don't understand. 
You don't have to quit your job to be used by God because God has placed you there as a platform for the gospel. Your job is not a means to make money to help the ministry, a means to make money so that you can do ministry. Your job is the ministry. Whether you're a businessman or you work at the mill, whether you're at the convenience store or the Walmart, whether you're at McDonald's or Subway, God has got you there because that's your mission. That's your mission field. And when I got a hold of that truth, I told you this last time, I tried to get a job at McDonald's. Because I was like, I'm going to go to McDonald's, I'm going to tell every single one of them about Jesus. Because when we understand that truth, I mean, it sets us free. Because if God's made you an engineer by the grace of God, then you have called to reach those people in that context. You don't have to go looking for a place to serve at, you know, elsewhere in the community you know, because you feel like you have no place. You are being watched. And just as I learned from you, others are learning from you. And I thank you for that. And you know this better than I, that your career is your mission field. Our mission is to, to reach the world begins by reaching our world. Our mission to reach the ends of the earth begins by reaching the ends of our earth. We may not be called to reach people globally, but every single one of us in this room is called to reach people locally. Jesus knew before he could reach the world that he had to reach his world. That's why he chose people in his context. Jesus perfected what we have been trying to perfect for 2,000 years since he left. And that is, he had a purpose. That was to die and bring reconciliation like we talked about today. But he didn't let that purpose affect him from reaching the people in his proximity. Man. I remember reading in the Acts where, where two of the disciples were going to, to worship and, and give alms and stuff at, and, and teach at the temple. They were going to teach about Jesus at the temple. And on their way, they met this blind beggar. And the blind beggar calls out to them. And so they look and they say, you know, silver and gold I have none, but I give you what, you what I have. Many of us today, if we're not careful, we'll get caught with what the disciples almost did. They were walking, they were praying, and that's great. But they almost missed an opportunity, right? Had they not been walking and praying and being aware where God was leading, they would have walked right by that guy and the mission field that they walked past. And what I found in my life growing up in a, in a minister's home is many times we put on our, 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 you know, our gloves and we go to our, our Christian events and it's like you know, we get our salt and we put it in the salt shaker and we drive it from our house to church and from church to our house and we like live at the church and we, we're barely at the house and we're doing awesome stuff for God, but we miss everyone in our neighborhood. We miss everyone and all these lost people we're supposed to come in contact with because it's kind of like the Good Samaritan. We're doing great things for God, but we're missing out on the people who need us most. So I I beg you to help. I beg you to understand tonight what God is teaching me. And that no matter what I do in life, no matter where I'm going, never let my purpose affect me from reaching the people in my proximity. And then lastly, we see to the ends of the earth. So I want to wrap up. You know, many of us tonight, if any of us will, will ever be called, you know, other than short-term mission, you know, trips to go and serve um, to serve in long-term context. But every single one of us have been called to serve at the ends of our earth. And so tonight I want to end with a story of, of when God just rocked my boat. I'm reading this book, like I told you, and it's about all this stuff, crazy God things that he does. And I, I mean, I heard this guy. I went to Ethiopia. And so me and these other five guys who have become some of my best friends, and I love them, and I pray for them daily. These five guys, I mean, these are like, the biblical men. Like, if I could choose anyone to go on mission with, it would be them. If I could ever choose five guys in the world, no matter who and where I was at, to go on mission, I would name these five guys every single time. We served together in Ethiopia, and I fell in love with their hearts. They're humble. They're gracious. I mean, everything they talk about and, and do is sprinkled with God's grace. And so, I mean, it just, it, I don't even feel worthy to be numbered among them. And so, we, we finally decided we would meet and have dinner. And we tried to do this when we first got back to Liberty. And, of course, exactly like what our team leader said, who is just newly married, he said, you know, if we don't plan this, it's going to, you know, it's just going to get away from us. We're not going to do it. And so exactly what he said happened. And three months later, a couple, couple weeks ago, we go to this Japanese place called Osaka's. It is one of my favorite places to eat. I mean, I love Osaka's. And so we choose to go to Osaka's. We choose to eat there. And one of the things we're going to talk about this night is this book that I've been reading because, man, this, our team leader read it and it rocked his world. I'm reading it. It's rocking my world. One of the other guys read it. And then I gave it, or my team leader gave his book, his copy, to this other guy. And it's rocking. He, he put on Facebook the other night and I was like, man, I know what you mean. Because it's just rocking his world. And so we're talking and we don't even get to the good stuff. Like we're still, 
you know, joking about things that happen in Ethiopia, like those inside jokes that no one else in the room thinks is funny and we think are hilarious. And we're not even got to the good part where we just begin to iron sharpens iron. How are you doing? I mean, I love our conversations because they just, you leave. I want to preach a sermon when I get done. I mean, one of the things I joke around and, and they quote me on is that'll preach. I mean, some of the stuff they say, I'm like taking notes over here. And so we're not even to the, part, to the good part. And this lady walks in, a lady that we might recognize very good. In, in cowgirl boots and in a camouflage jacket. Looks like what many of us had come from, just that they've had a hard life and they, they've been around a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs. And so we're sitting there, we're talking, and, and I'm aware of this. You know, since my heart problem, I'm like this super secret agent. I can tell you where every exit's at because I'm afraid I'm going to pass out at any second. And so, so I, I see her coming in and I see her and she's making a beeline towards us. She is just heading straight for us. And so, I, I'm like, oh, great, what's going on? And she comes right up to us. She's, you are from Liberty, right? Oh, man, because we get that a lot. I mean, some people hated Jerry Falwell. He said a lot. You know, I don't know if I agree with everything he said. Some people hate his guts. Some people love him to death. And so you never know what you're going to get. You're from Liberty, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. And, I, and again, I've been raised in ministry. I can, I know, you know, I've, I've almost hid behind this thing where we never know if it's a scam. And so we've helped plenty of homeless people, but I, I got in my brain, like I'm trying to size her up. Is this a scam? And she begins to tell the story. And, and how we talk about it, I'm sure y'all have to deal with the same thing. Like when they start giving you these crazy scenarios and all these different examples and excuses, you're like, come on, like, go ahead. You're going to ask for money. And she gets done and she says, can you take me to the hospital? My son has been in a wreck and he's in a halo and he has multiple contusions and, and, and spots and, and cuts and scrapes and gashes in his liver and broken bones and all this stuff. Would you just take me to the hospital? And so she told the story. She literally, she was walking. She just got out of like every rehab place in Lynchburg. She just got out of the last one and it didn't work. And so she's walking behind this Japanese restaurant. She loses her phone and finds out she can't find her phone. Then she looks for her bus pass and realizes hours later after she lost her phone, she lost her bus pass. Then she finds herself behind this Osaka Japanese restaurant where five guys, six guys who went to Africa together who were talking and, and kind of in our hearts we know, man, it's kind of like this, the, talking about the good old days where you know you'll never be on mission with these people again. You'll never get to serve with these people. And it just hurts your heart to talk about that, how you'll never get to be in that context with these people again. And God, in his humor, in his sovereignty, in his trying to teach Keith Flanagan and the rest of us guys a lesson, he just hands her to us and says, there you go, big boys. You talk a lot of game. You talk a lot about how you want to live on mission. You talk a lot about how you can't find lost people, and I just gave you one. And so next thing you know, we are in the car, we're heading to the hospital, and we're standing around this guy who we have no idea who he is, and we're praying with this guy. And we get the opportunity to, to talk about Jesus and pray with Jesus, or pray about Jesus, and then we get to help her. We all signed her Bible, of course, because, you know, in our culture, everyone has a Bible. Everyone knows about Jesus, and, that you know, as we talk about today, he's this stranger in the manger. Everybody knows who he is. She, she made the famous quote that I hear so many times in our culture, and, well, when I get my life right, I'll come to church. And it just hurt my heart because I know that culture all so well. I was a part of that culture, culture all so well. So that Sunday she goes to church with us, with some of my buddies. Um, she, she gets to go to church, and, and hopefully when we get back, we'll continue to get to pour their lives. And, and sadly, you know, we got to meet a lot of the family. There was a lot of different types, people who were hardened to God, people who didn't really know about God, who didn't care and then people who put up a good front, who knows where they're at. But the point is, we got to share the gospel with those people. And we got to live out what it looked like to just walk up. And then, he, then the coolest part was when they would ask, how in the world you met? And I was like, oh, you better buckle up. I got a 10-minute story for you. And I'd tell them how all this crazy stuff had come together, and God had ordained this moment for us to meet. And then the next night, you know, because God just has such a sense of humor, we go back, we meet. The coolest thing for us, we got to encourage these two believers. One, one young lady just got saved. And she, the whole time I'm sitting there talking, and I mean, I'm, this one guy's hardened to the gospel. I mean, he didn't want to hear nothing I said. So we talked about deer hunting and stuff because, again, I, I know that culture. And so we talked, and the, the coolest thing was she sat there the whole time. I had no idea she was a Christian. Later I find out that she's very young in her faith. And so the whole time I'm talking about Jesus and giving an example like many of you did to me when I was younger and, and what it looked like to stand up in a, in a, in a, to a people who don't like you and to be 
uh, the hands and feet of Jesus. She got to see that. And it was so awesome. And then we go, her mom's waiting downstairs. And she literally had the same burden, except in, in, a, in a different way. She was like, I want to thank you so much because God has used you in my life in such a big way. I've been wanting God to show me how to, to be his hands and feet and to do this, to, to go out and be on mission for God. And it's been burdening. And she didn't know the lingo like we all know, our Christian lingo. And she literally was just so amazed that God had brought all this together. I mean, we're just having a ball. She's in tears because we're just, we're praising and high-fiving about Jesus. And around this corner comes this guy that knew the little girl, the young lady upstairs. And I knew his stinking name. I knew who he was. I had met him for five minutes about a month before at a youth event because he came with one of our leaders. And she has been trying to plant seeds of the gospel in his life. And so God, in his sense of humor, I meet him. And I'm literally, as soon as he left 10 minutes later, I was like, I was just convicted about, God, God I'm sorry. I did not have a conversation that mattered with that guy. I just, I did what I usually do. And I skated on what's easy to talk about. And so we had small talk. We never got to the good stuff. And here comes this guy named Jonathan. And she says, this is, and I was like, oh, I know Jonathan. I know this guy. And it was just such a beautiful picture of what we're talking about tonight. God's Spirit is ordaining moments for you to witness to people. And so we sat around and we talked about how God had just been moving and doing amazing cool stuff that we couldn't think about. And what we continued to say was, man, we're just not worthy. I told him, I said, guys, I think God's wanting me to talk about this and preach about this, but there's something wrong. I don't feel worthy to talk about this because I am the chief of sinners. And one guy looked at me and said, that is what makes you eligible to talk about it. Because you understand that you are not anywhere near getting this thing right and so we talked for like an hour and it was just like we were back back in Ethiopia except without you know the food I mean we're just sitting there in the cafeteria and we're talking and we're just dapping each other up and we're speechless because God has just in in his amazing sovereignty just molded all of this together things we couldn't even begin to put together and he just divinely began to set the pieces together even to the point of hey what time are we going to eat where are we going to eat she lost her bus pass. She lost her cell phone. She ends up at this restaurant. And I wish I could tell you that they all gave their life to Christ. And, you know, it was this beautiful evangelistic, you know, ending. But the reality is there's still work to be done. And when we get back, I'm going to continue to pray for those people. We're going to continue to help Miss Pearl because we can. And those people who don't want to be helped, we're going to continue to pray that God pushes us back together because he can. So as we close, I want to ask you, what is your Jerusalem? What is your, Ju your Judea and your Samaria? What is your ends of your earth? Where has God put you that you can be more intentional about having conversations that matter and reaching people? Where has God placed you to reach your nation? I want to end with the story of this guy who spoke at Combo, and I watched it the other night, and I never heard this part, but, but he talked about his supervisor who led this mission for people to go and to serve in these places, and this spe specific mission, and this mission bore like IMB, and he said, you know, this man is a man you could follow, and he told the story about what happened on 9-11, and he said, the first thing he thought, the first thing he did, the first thing that happened was he fell on his knees, and he said, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. He said, God, forgive us because we never made it to their country. God, forgive us because we never made it to their city. We never made it to their village. We never made it to their Jerusalem, to their home. We never broke bread with them and showed them the love of Christ. God, forgive me because we never made it. I think it's no, no stretch to say the reason in the places we send the most air support and drones and troops are the same places that are in the most need of the gospel. And we may never go to those places. Many of us, most of us, maybe all of us never will. But there is people in our context right now that are in the same boat they are. They've been raised. They don't know any other thing. They may know what we're about. They may even know who we're about, but they don't know who we serve. They don't know the love that Jesus has given us. They don't know the joy that Jesus has given us. So whether it be the, the pervert down the road or the murderer or, or the, the petty crime thief or just the person that was raised without the gospel, we can get to them. And, and I want to, 
I pray that I never get to this point, and I pray that we never get to this point tonight. And that is what that Muslim man said. And that, that Muslim, ten Muslims looked at them, radi- not radical, but very devout Muslims, and they said, I pray that I never hear the words that they heard. Why have you kept Jesus from me? I thank you so much, and, and I pray that God would use this message. So as, as the invitation begins and our music minister steps up, I want to encourage you to understand that you're a missionary. Many, if not all of us here tonight, are mature Christians, and we understand the mission of God. But I honestly think this message was for all of us because all of us, if we're not careful, slip right back into the complacency and the the vacation state that we swore to God we'd never return to. This is something that tomorrow I'm going to have to deal with. This is something the next day I'm going to have to deal with. This is something I have to continue to wake up because I continue to trip over my dead body. But I want to ask you today to pray to God and ask Him, what is your Jerusalem? What is your, your Judea? Maybe you have people in your heart right now that, that, that you have been called to reach. I thank you again for all the words and, and God in his sovereignty using your words and your actions and how you lived your life to reach me. And I pray we never have to hear the words, why did you keep Jesus from me? Thank you. Let's all stand. Please be seated for just a few moments. Um, where do I begin after a message like that? There's nothing I need to say to follow up with that. Nothing I can say to uh, uh, that needs to be added, you know, to that message tonight. When I said this morning to encourage you to come back tonight because you would be challenged, I did not know it would be challenged like that, my brother. But I appreciate that. And brother Keith could have came and just showed off his education he's gotten at Liberty and just wowed us and impressed us with a lot of theological rhetoric. He did not do that tonight. You know, one thing I've learned about a mirror is a mirror is going to be honest with you. It'll show you exactly what the reflection is. You know, there's nothing that's going to lie to you. It's not going to embellish you. It's going to show you just what you what you are. The Word of God is a mirror. So I still like to say this. If this message was kind of um, kind of offensive to you tonight, as the preachers say, if this message offended you, you needed to be offended. A lot of times we gravitate, we don't gravitate towards the things that are abrasive and challenging. We, in our human nature, we gravitate towards the things that are comfortable. So out of this message tonight, I want to encourage you. 
and I just wanted to give you some, some, some following remarks and how, how God really spoke to me, and that is we should never gravitate towards just what's comfortable. I don't believe God is necessarily wanting to bless what's comfortable, but he will bless our obedience when we embrace even the things that are not comfortable. You know, I think about Peter, and I'm not preaching on the sermon, okay, so you, you can still get your car keys ready and all that stuff you normally do, okay? You know, I think about Peter. Peter, the other 11, they stayed in their comfortable positions in the boat, but not Peter. You know, we say a lot about Peter with negative connotations and make fun of him, deride him, but at least, though, boy, he rocked the boat. He got out, and he did what Jesus told him to do. Jesus said, come, a one-word message, and next thing you know, oh, Peter's walking on water. You know, a lot of times, you know, when, um, when we're shooting at the bullseye, because the message tonight was a life living on the mission. Another way we can say is a life that is on target. A lot of times I know I, I'm not a big, you know, dart thrower, but, you know, just the few times I've done it in my life, I'm happy just to get on the paper. Can I get a witness? Anybody else? Happy just to get on the paper somewhere. And so you're just content with just getting it somewhere, and even though you're not hitting bullseye, you're, just, you're fine to get it on paper. A lot of times that is, a, that is a testimony of our Christian life as well. Our life is, and we know it, we know our life is not hitting the bullseye. We're just happy just to be a Christian. We're happy just to be in a church, or we're happy just to be alive. But listen, is your life hitting the bullseye that God has intended for your life to hit? Jesus told his disciples, you will be witnesses in Judea, in, 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 in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. We as individuals and we as a church cannot be comfortable just to be hitting the target in Yuli or in Fernandina. But listen, we cannot be comfortable just by hitting local targets. We must be, we must be uh, compelled to embrace Jesus' direct plan for our lives and living a life on track, living a life on target, living that life on mission. It might not be comfortable, but I promise you this, it'll be well worth it. One of my near, dear friends is in heaven, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Harper. Love the Lord, a preaching, preaching machine. He worked at the same company I did, Southeast Toyota, for a number of years. Walked away from a very lucrative job. Went to college in Clear Creek up in Kentucky. Came back and was, was doing some revivals. Was, get, was, was, was going to get into pastoring. But at the, in his mid-40s, he got a brain tumor. He's on his deathbed. He's not going not gonna to survive. He told me, and, he, and I'll never forget this. He said his only regret is that he cannot do more for Jesus. A lot of times when we see people on their deathbed, their testimony is different. They regret, they wish they would have done more for Jesus. My epitaph for my friend who's in heaven today is that he had a righteous regret. A righteous regret. Not that he should have done, but that he wanted to stay and do more for Jesus. The late, great Adrian Rogers. Love that man. He said these words. A lot of preachers, they say these words. Get right. Give your life to Jesus because you may die. He said, I say these words, get right and give your life to Jesus but you, because you might live. And if Jesus allows us to wake up tomorrow, I want to encourage you to discover what God's targets, what his bullseye is for your life and live that life on mission. Don't let nothing or nobody stand in your way or stop you from becoming, becoming the man of God that God wants you to be, and the woman of God that God wants you to be. God has given us a level of influence for a reason. And the word influence is two words. It means inflow. God wants us to flow into somebody's life. God does not want us to be a stagnant pond somewhere. God wants us to flow as the rivers flow into the oceans. God wants us to flow into somebody's life. And listen, God, God have mercy on us. And I'm speaking to me right now who when we sit on our blessed assurances and don't flow into people's life, we have a life, we have a message that can bring life, and God have mercy on us if we hold it in. Can I encourage you? If God wakes you up tomorrow, live a life on mission for Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, thank you for your message. Thank you for your minister, Lord God, who brought the message but, God, our focus is on the master and the master's blueprint for our lives, Father God. I did not design my own, and, um, uh, or it would certainly be a mess. God, I'm grateful. 
to be doing what you've called me to do. And I certainly, you know my heart, I'm not boasting because I've let you down a lot. But God, I do pray that you forgive us tonight. Dear Father God, the, the, the ones of us, myself included, whom you have really spoken to tonight, dear Father God, forgive us for being complacent. God, forgive us for uh, just being so uh, just narrow-minded on, on just uh, uh, um, uh, on, on certain agendas that, that is not your agenda. But God, help us just to be kingdom-minded. And God, I just thank you uh, just for uh, helping us to live a life that's on target. God, I just thank you for how you will bless. We pray this believing because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us this evening? Uh, reach out to your neighbor. We're going to sing our song of dismissal tonight. Please take a few, uh, a few moments to come by and uh, speak to Brother Keith. Let him know that if you appreciated him and his support. Um, I really wanted to bring him in here today. You know, he's gone you know, on, on vacation the first part of this week. I knew what, I wouldn't have time to prepare to preach. But even putting that aside, I know God's hand is on Keith's life. I want to give him the experience that he needs. So thank you for uh, being our church family to be here this morning and tonight to support him, continue to pray for him. You know why? Because, listen, he loves Jesus. He's doing what God wants him to do. He has a huge target on his back. The devil hates Keith Flanagan, okay? He hates him. So you pray for him that he will continue to live a life on track. Brother Richard. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen.